Testing. Testing. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this morning's session. Good morning and welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school and it is not a church. Neither are we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of His eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. This goes as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We've been incorporated throughout the, throughout the United States and California. <laughs> oh. Alaska. Wow, oh, all that stuff. Anyway, this has been all over the world. Uh, the Archetype Pattern Workshop established in February 2000, 20, 20, 2021. Oh boy. Okay, now in the school, we use and teach by the true and original name and titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word of Son is Elohim. It has also been improperly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We don't know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord of God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that. The Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and the original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in His pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize Himself because a cloud is no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word of Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now this shape and form can only be seen 
in the divine vision is understood in the divine revelation. Now later on, the self-same spirit manifests himself in the physical body and walks the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh had the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a port round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten names of this institute are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, the so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watcher is peace. Our slogan, speak the truth. This morning we have a prayer by Dr. Irene Ramirez. Our scripture lesson is 1 John, the fifth chapter. Our scripture reader will be Dr. Kenway Kleinsmith. And we'll have a selection of music after the prayer. Good morning and good afternoon, class. We'd like to ask Yahweh or Elohim to give us some more of this knowledge, because we need it, some more wisdom, and some more understanding. And we ask this in his son's name, Yahshua, who is our Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I would like to make a little shout out to our people that have been watching and to everyone that watches, we'd like to welcome you to our class. I'd like to say hello to Hattie 
that's from New York. Um, everyone else, uh, the one I've been noticing is, if I pronounce her name right, is um, Miro. 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 I'm not sure, is she from? Uh, She's from Zambia. Zambia, welcome. And everyone else, welcome to our class. And to uh, Joe over there, hello, and thank you. Study Bible, King James Version, 1 John 5. Whosoever believeth that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh, and everyone that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of Yahweh when we love Yahweh and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of Yahweh overcometh the world, 
And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yahshua is the son of Yahweh? This is he that came by water and blood, even Yahshua the Messiah, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is a spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. For there are three that record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of Yahweh is greater, for this is the witness of Yahweh, which he has testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of Yahweh hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not Yahweh hath made him a liar, because he believeth that the record that Yahweh gave of his Son. And this is a record that Yahweh giveth to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of Yahweh hateth not life. These things have I written unto you that believeth on the name of the Son of Yahweh, that you may know that ye have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of Yahweh. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a son unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of Yahweh sinneth not, but he is begotten of Yahweh, keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of Yahweh, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of Yahweh has come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Yahshua the Messiah. This is your true, this is your true Yahweh and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. All right, good morning once again. Uh, sorry for the little technicalities we have here. Our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Ari Ramirez. Good morning, good afternoon, class. Good morning. Yeah. Glad to see you guys that are tuning in on YouTube. You know, the two Dorothys, um, Carol, and our brother Dennis Pratt. Welcome. And uh, I'd like to get a little bit into this um, teaching, especially when I came in, what I heard, and what I believe now is that. The only way you're going to get to learn about your Messiah and who is the Savior is to go back to Moses. The Messiah says it over again. If you would have believed in Moses, you believe me. Because he wrote of him. How did he write of him? He wrote of him in the law and in the prophets. They wrote of him. They wrote of him uh, what he was going to do, who was going to come in. But let's see what the Messiah said. Let's get Matthew 5. And 17. I mean, yeah, Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot 
or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Go ahead. Mormons. Whatsoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. So Yahshua says he coming to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now we know, we learned the first five books of the Bible, Moses wrote, and that is the law. From Joshua on to Malachi, that is the prophets. And they prophesied the Messiah. But the Messiah says to, to learn of him. Over there, you know, this is when he was talking in Matthew 5 and 17, he was alive walking around in a physical body, and the light was a physical body, I'll put it that way. And then when he was crucified, after his crucifixion, you know, he sticks to the same story. He just keeps on saying, oh, Lord, again. Let's get um, Luke 24, and, um, uh, which I started, let's see. 24, 24, 25. Luke 24, 25. Think not the Messiah to have some of him. Yeah, let's just start at, uh, start, I'm sorry. Go ahead, start at, uh, go ahead, keep start, going. Start at 25. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto him, unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Okay, then go ahead and get uh, 44, is it? 44. Yes. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, and that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Okay. You know, there's Yahshua again telling us the same thing, to go back to Moses. If you want to learn anything about your Savior, you go back there. So you can learn about him. And you know, when you do that, you start learning how to read the Bible also. He teaches you all things. You know, he is the comforter. He is the Holy Spirit that teaches all things. And he's taught me that, to go back to Moses. Why? Because I can learn about Yahshua. And I can see what these things he's going to fulfill. One of the things is on uh, over there in Exodus 3 and 1. Just a little bit of that we're going to touch on. Exodus 3 and 1. Okay. Whoops. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Yahweh, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not, cons not burnt. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, he called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not thy hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Okay, we're going to stop right there for a minute. Well, Moses, we're reading about Moses and his experiences when he's meeting Yahweh Elohim for the first time. He is seen, I mean, he is learning about him, but he is seeing things, and things are being revealed to him. And he's telling us that this is what happened to him. He saw this burning bush that was not being consumed. And that later on, in this chapter, we're going to read about what he tells, what he came down to do. Let's jump back to that. What is, uh, 
Yahweh El, what does it come down to do? Uh, is it Yeah, uh, do a verse up. Uh, 12. Go ahead. 3, 12. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve Yahweh upon this mountain. Mm -hmm. And Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Okay, right there. Moses is asking a very important question. He's asking them, okay now, now I'm going to go down and tell the children of Israel that you sent me, but what should I tell them their name is? Because down in Egypt, where he was at one time, Moses, they had they worshipped many gods, and they all had names. And this one that appeared to Moses out of this burning bush tells him, okay? And Moses questions him and asks this question. Go ahead. And Elohim said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me unto you. And God and Elohim and God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord, Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. Okay, stop right there. Now we have, we come to this class, we start learning about that Lord is a title. God is a title. So when they wrote that, that King James Version wrote that, that's all they had was that Lord and God, which is not, that's titles, that's not a name. And he says his name is. So read that in the uh, Holy Name Bible, please. And Elohim said unto Moses, I, I am that I am, and he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I will be, have sent me unto you. And Elohim said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim for your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Um, do we do we skip a little bit? Go go and gather the elders of Israel together. What is that you want? The name. I didn't hear the name. Repeat the oh. verse. And Elohim El said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. Okay, now. He tells them what his name is. Yahweh, and his title is Elohim. And he says, this is my name forever. This is a memorial unto all generations. Now, when he says forever, I think we're still in that right now. We're still in that forever. It hasn't ended yet. This earth hasn't come to an end. So, you know, there's no need to change my name. This is my name. I'm giving it to him. Moses. And so Moses has a name when he goes down into Egypt. And he starts telling these people. Most of all, he was told to go see Pharaoh. So he goes and tells Pharaoh. And Yahweh, before that, Yahweh had given them some signs to go down to show Pharaoh. That Yahweh Elohim sent it down to him. Moses down to Egypt. But when he goes to Pharaoh, Moses says, you know, Yahweh, the Elohim of Moses, says, let my people go so they can worship me for all. And Pharaoh, what he says, he says, I will not, I don't know this Yahweh, I'm not gonna let the people go. So it goes on on the story. But this thing is that Yahweh reveals his name to a man, his name was Moses, back over here. In a burning bush that was not being consumed. He gave his name, and he gave his name to give to his people. And he did deliver them out of Egypt. But what I'm saying is this. Yahshua says he come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And right there, right there in that verse, there's that verse in um, John 5 and 39, where he reveals that he says a name again. He mentions that name. What he comes to do, what he come in. Let's get John 5 and go ahead and start at 39. 
John 5 and 39. John 5 and 39. Go ahead. Ye search the scriptures, okay. for in them think you have eternal life, and there they must testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I see, receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of Yahweh in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Okay. He's right there saying, he come in his Father's name. What's his Father's name? His Father's name is Yahweh. His name is Yahshua. He came to them in his Father's name. Yahweh. My name is Yahshua. His Father's name is in him. You see it right here. Illustrate. Yahweh, Yahshua. The first part of Yahweh is masculine, just like Yahshua. There it is, masculine. I come in my father's name. When, he, when Yahweh Elohim comes to Moses, he came as an angel in the cloud. And he says, I am the Elohim of your fathers. And he grins down all the generations, all the way, the important ones as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He appeared to them. Those were his forefathers, Moses. He told Moses he could take that down to Egypt so he could deliver the children out of Egypt. Yahweh Elohim, Yahshua, he comes down and he says that he comes in his father's name and they receive him not. Well, today, the same thing happening. We come in the father's name. The father's name is Yahweh. We know the son's name is Yahshua. We come in his name. Preaching and teaching what he taught to his disciples, Yahshua the Messiah. So that's all we're trying to get out there to tell out there to the world. To let them know that Yahweh is that's his name, and his name is Yahshua. And he's coming to fulfill. And fulfill means to bring to end, to stop. To bring to end of everything that was written of him in Moses and in the prophets, Yahshua. Well, with us now, He's focused he's still fulfilling in us. He's teaching us how to see him. He's teaching us how to read. He's fulfilling. He brought those things that he fulfilled in the law and prophets to an end and nailed them to his cross, which we have learned. But he's still teaching us so we could share it out there with you. And uh, that's just a little, little teeny little thing I want to put in right there. And you guys all have a great day out there. And I'll leave it up to the next speaker to pick it up. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, our next speaker will be Dr. Will Williams. So, let's see. 
This is our 40 play exercise or game, depending on who you give it to, what you stick it in. So she was the first speaker, and I'll let her determine the, the course of path we shall take. She says, oh boy, I haven't even seen the number yet. She says, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Play 38. Okay. Play 38. We're going to combine what she said and we're going to use the pattern. We're going to get play 38. While you have it, may as well bring up play 38, 39, and 40. Mm -hmm. May as well. So. Right. Which is the beginning. Why? 
because Yahweh declares the end mm -hmm. from the beginning. And if you're going to talk about cosmogony, then you're going to have to talk about, well, what was the cause of the cosmogony? Then that's why we have the Godhead up here. I know this is not going to be good. just by the pull of a number, okay? But that's okay, because Dr. Kinley, when he painted these charts, see, these charts are an illustration of a divine vision and revelation. And he meant for these charts to be engaged, because that would be a way for you to ascertain the purpose of Yahweh as he's laid it out from beginning to ending, okay? Now, since she pulled that, let's pick this, let's start with this. Let's get 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Now, if you remember, we talked about the pattern, the tabernacle pattern. There are seven steps in this tabernacle pattern. This tabernacle pattern also corresponds with what we call the migratory pattern. See, see this is here. Egypt, wilderness of Sinai, Canaan's land. The comparison between those two plates, let me see here. The comparison between these two, this is the migratory pattern, this is the tabernacle pattern. The comparison between these two the correlations, it's the same correlations you're going to use on all of them. All right? Just to recap, uh, here, see, there's seven steps. First step is the gate. See, we're almost entering. Second step is the altar sin sacrifice, representing death. Also, blood was put on the four horns. Third step is this brazen labor, where the priests Wash themselves and the sacrifices, the typifying a burial, also representing a washing and regeneration. The fourth step is this door with the cup of holy anointing on at the door, typifying spirit or resurrection. The fifth step is the whole holy place. See, with the seven branch lampstand, these were objects of gold, whereas these were objects of brass. The golden seven branch lampstand, the golden table of shoe bread, the golden altar of incense. Succinctly speaking, just simply say light, bread, mm. intercessor. The sixth step is the second departmental veil of blue, purple, and scarlet that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The seventh step is this Ark of the Covenant. See, and where we have two archangels on top of the mercy seat. Inside was an Aaron's rod that put into almonds, the pot of manna, and the second tables of stone. And this represents the seat of authority where the cloud that took the Israelites, led them rather, led them, was sit between the two wings, to, between the two archangels of this uh, mercy seat, all right, symbolizing the seat of authority. All right, so now you can get into it as much as you like, but that's basically it. Those are the correlations that you're going to use to understand what's going on along these plates. Also, and you, and you can look this up with uh, Jacob in, in Genesis, uh, we well, may as well read it. Genesis uh, 28 and 10. I think it is. And we'll, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Genesis 28 and 10. Uh -huh. And Jacob went off from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Mm -hmm. And he lighted upon a certain place and 
tarried there all night mm -hmm. because the sun was set. Mm -hmm. And he took the stones of the place and put them for his pillows mm -hmm. and laid down in that place to sleep. Now see how he laid down and went to sleep. That's a type of a death. Okay, read. And he dreamed. And he dreamed. So now he is immersed in a dream. Read. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of Yahweh descending and ascending on it. Descending and ascending. That's a principle. Because that's what this tabernacle pattern does. It shows the principles. See, like a ladder, because we said there were seven steps. Mm -hmm. So like a ladder, okay. And what do you do on a ladder? You either climb up it or you climb down it. Right. Okay. And so now that's the, that's, these are the principles you want to look for when you look at these plates, whether they're ascending or descending, or in some cases doing both. See, even the most holy place represents a heaven line. It's a type of heaven. That's a, just like you have a bloodline here, a bloodline that goes across. You have a water line that goes across. You have a spirit line that goes across. You also have a heaven line that goes across, okay? Now, now we're going to go to Thessalonians. Okay, First Thessalonians 4 and 13, you said? I believe it is, yes. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, mm -hmm. concerning which, discerning, concerning them which are asleep, mm -hmm. that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Mm -hmm. For if you believe that Yahshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yahshua, will, will he bring them, bring him, bring them, bring him. I'm sorry. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahweh, mm -hmm. that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of, our, of the Savior shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, hold it, I can't put your leg in there. Now, Yahshua shall descend from heaven with a shout. Here's heaven. Where is heaven at in this age? See, heaven is not a geographical location. Right. Unless you're talking about the first and second heaven. The first heaven is space, the second heaven is atmosphere. But the third heaven, see, is not geographical. Right. See? So now it says heaven here, but also says here, new covenant written in the heart and in the mind. See? Uh, you know, I need plate 14 over there. Uh, once you finish reading the king away, if you can take up and let, and let her go. 16 verse. Verse 16, yeah. Where was that? 416. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I want, I want uh, the angelic transgression plate. That's what I want. 14. 16. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Yahshua shall descend. Now here it is. Here's heaven. He shall descend from heaven with a shout. This plate, eschatology, this is a descending plate. All right? Shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is a descending plate. All right? And so now he's got to cross a veil. I'm stalling until she gives me this, <laughs> this chart. Uh, it should be plate 14. And I think it is. Yeah. Should we play 14? Mm -hmm. for 13, 14. I know. So the angels are getting kicked off. Yeah. Look for plate four, because it should be right under under plate four. Look for plate four, and it should be right under that, right? Six. I have seven. 
Don't you got it up here already? Oh, you know what? You know what? You know what? You know what? You, know what? That's, you need to hurry up and do this because this is getting this is confusing to me. Yeah, I uh, well, yeah we got a single these things on and this is blowing my mind. Okay, I do was yeah. All right, here we go. All right, now I guess what I want to do. Now, somebody, keep your finger there, and one of you get Acts 17, 24. Okay, I'm off to a slow start, I hate this. But keep your finger there, because we're going to come back. So we're going to get Acts 17, 24. Because see, Yahshua, it says Yahshua, see, for him to do that, to appear, he's got to cross a veil. Trying to show you what right. this veil is. Hello. Seventeen and twenty-four. Yes. Yahweh, who made the world and all things therein, mm -hmm. seeing that He is ruler of heaven and earth, He dwelt not in temples made with hands. Mm -hmm. Neither He worshipped with man's hands, as though He needs anything, mm -hmm. seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one man all nations of men or to dwell, to dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation mm -hmm. that they should seek him if happily they might go after, all right. after him. Okay, that have made of one man, mm -hmm. all nations of men to dwell upon all the face of the earth, one man, one man Adam. In other words, the whole human race is a vandal. This is a video, right? Okay? And so for Yahshua to appear to the whole human race, he would have to appear, that's why I want this play here in the transgression, he's going to have to appear in a state of incorporeal visibility. Because see here, they're behind a veil, angelic invisibility, see, which is where Yahshua is now, as far as the human race is concerned. He's behind the veil because they, they don't see him, even though he's there. They don't see him, but then now Yahshua has to transcend the veil here. Mm -hmm. Just like this was veil was transcended here. See, here, they're in a state of incorporeal visibility. That means they can appear in a vision, draw a line. They can, Yahshua can appear. See, Yahshua revealed from heaven. He's appearing in a vision because he's He's transversing a veil. Look, go back here. Keep, keep your finger there. Go to uh, Acts 1 and 9. See, because here, here, this is Dr. Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Okay, so what are we throwing here? Acts 1 and 9. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Mm -hmm. while, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Yahshua, which is taken up from you unto heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Okay, now, what do you mean? See, because one, here's the error that the world makes. One, they think that when Yahshua Messiah resurrected from the grave, he resurrected a physical body. Right. So they so and so when he ascended, they feel that he ascended physically. So quite naturally, they expect him when they when they think he's he's coming back to come back physically. When that's not the case, see, here they saw him transverse the cloud which in this case is like a veil. I'm talking about the disciples, they saw him step into the cloud, see, and that was it. They saw no, they, now you see him, now you don't. Then right. they saw no similitude. See, why? Because that's like the high priest. Come here. It's like the high priest here on the Day of Atonement. See, on the Day of Atonement, he had to get all coals on the altar of incense, and see, and he would come up on a cloud. 
See, and transfers the veil. He would be, talking about the high priest, he would be enveloped in a cloud of smoke. Okay? See, and then performing his duties in front of the Ark of the Covenant, doing his figure eight, and then come out. Okay, but him, but see, but once he transfers the veil, everybody else down here, they can't see him no more. However, they could hear him. Right. Because he had bells and pomegranates on his skirt, on his skirt, talking about the high priest. They could hear, they could hear what he was saying. They could, I'd rather hear the bells, and they know as long as they heard the bells, he was okay. But but if he's up here and the bells stopped, then they know that he was messed up. See, and Yahweh done broke forth, you know, and killed him. And see, and nobody's gonna go up in there and get him, they're gonna get some meat hooks, you know, and right. go up under there and feel him out and drag him out of there. But the point I want to make is, is, is coming from behind the veil, appearing in a state of incorporeal visibility. This is how Yahshua is going to appear universally so, in a state of incorporeal visibility, coming behind the veil, ridding the veil. What veil? The, this veil. The whole human race, 8 billion people, is one flesh. We're all one flesh. No matter what race you come from, nationality, the whole human race is of one flesh. The problem is we just need to be one in the spirit. Right. But we are already of one flesh because we just read, out of one man all nations of the earth came forth. So now that veil has to be ripped and Yahshua will appear to the whole human race in a state of incorporeal visibility. That is to say, inside their consciousness. Okay? Let's go back to Thessalonians. Where have you left off? Uh, where did you left off? 4 and 12? No, 16 maybe? Yes, 16. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, mm -hmm. and with the trumpet of Yahweh. And the dead in the Messiah shall first rise first. Mm -hmm. Then we shall, then we which are alive and reign, remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yahshua in the air. Mm -hmm. I see the, yeah, the, the God finished that. Okay. In the, Yahshua in the soul, and so shall we ever be with him. Mm -hmm. You can read it as it is, I don't care. Okay. Uh, cause, cause some, see, in the air. Yeah, you can read it as it is, because people say, oh, see, see, in the air. That means, you know, that the bodies are going to resurrect and, and we're all going to fall on up to him, you know, he's going to be hanging up in the sky in mid air somewhere, see, and, and then they think that. However, see, we have a pattern. See, and we know that there are three heavens, okay? First, uh, second, second Corinthians uh, 12 and 1, and while you had to get, uh, just to be prepared, second Thessalonians 1 and 6, I believe it's, but read uh, quickly because I'm, I'm I think all you're going on Second Corinthians 12 and 1. Yeah. It is like expedient for it is like expedient for me doubtless to glory. Mm -hmm. I will come to visions and revelations mm -hmm. of Yahweh. I knew a man in the Messiah about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. Mm -hmm. Yahweh knoweth. Such an one caught up in the third heaven. Okay, caught up to the third heaven. Now, if there's a third heaven, that would preclude there's a first and a second heaven, okay? And you can ask an average preacher about that, you know, because they'll, now, the pre an average preacher will say, oh, yeah, there's a third heaven, why? Because the Bible says so, it's read it. But ask them, they'll say, so what's the first and second heaven? Uh, see, what's the first, you know, if there's a third heaven, then what's the first and second? See, without a pattern, you wouldn't know. Right. You'd just be guessing. Go ahead and finish that. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, mm -hmm. I cannot tell, Yahweh knowing. Agreed. Um, that he was taught up into, uh, that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. All right. Now, I've got my arm here, the third heaven, which is Canaan's land. So the first heaven, see, which would be Egypt or space. Space is black, that's why it's painted black down here, it's dark. Space is black, it's a bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. The second heaven is the atmospheric heaven, see? It is also called the firmament. 
The third heaven is spirit law or is eternal and is not a geographical location. The first two heavens emanate from the third. Okay? Because from the third heaven is, is where everything comes from. Keep this in mind because we're going to, we'll, we'll be jumping back to that uh, uh, cosmogony in a little bit. But right now I'm setting it up from the end with, with eschatology. See? Because Paul, see, it says, Yahshua says, Yahshua revealed from heaven. What heaven is he revealed from? Space? Sun, moon, and stars? No. Mm -hmm. Atmospheric heaven where the clouds and the birds fly through it? Nope. No. See, the true heaven or the third heaven is where Yahshua dwells, which right. is why I'm here. He's sitting on his throne. Mm -hmm. See? Because man will look everywhere under the oceans and the skies and the outer space, except in one place where he wouldn't think Yahweh is at within himself. Mm. So this is the heaven from where Yahweh will be revealed from in everyone's consciousness, not coming from beyond the sun, moon, and stars, not coming up in the, in the clouds, but coming from here. See? Okay? And that's what this is pointing to. Now, read 2 Thessalonians 1 and 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with Yahweh to represent tribulations to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, mm -hmm. in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. All right, taking flaming vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. And here they are in the lake of fire right here. And look, Yahweh said Yahshua is going to take flaming vengeance. Right. Now, for you not to be part of that vengeance that he's going to put upon him, you would have to be likened unto him. Because when he appears, those that are in him will appear in him in that flaming fire. In other words, you will, you along with Yahshua, will execute punishment upon the world. And that could mean people that you know, your loved ones, your family, your friends, your boss, or whoever. Who didn't hear the gospel? You and Yahshua, you in Yahshua, right? Will execute flaming vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. And listen, when these people appear, that when when Yahshua appears here, see these folks here, they you know they won't be appearing with him because the clothes that they have will be like rags. In other right. words, they're clothed upon with their concepts, with their opinions their theories, their hypotheses, and which is flesh. Mm -hmm. And see, they will be burnt up, see, in the presence of Yahshua. Because when Yahshua is revealed from heaven, you are revealed in Yahshua in him. And it will be seen by these folks. They were like, you mean to tell me all along, you know, mm -hmm. you were telling me the truth? But at this point, it's too late. Mm -hmm. See? And see, and look, fire can't hurt fire. Right. See, fire just can't hurt fire. And so, and, and it goes, and, and the lake of fire is not some special place. The lake of fire is Yahweh. Right. Because Yahweh is a consuming fire. The creation came out right. from fire. So it has to go back into fire. See? And this is a descending plate. And it goes down. <laughs> then we come over to this plate, the renovation of the earth. And this is an ascending plate. Mm -hmm. See? Where everything is renovated. In other words, everything is translated back into the corporeal state, the new earth state. See, people will sit up and say, well, I got my new earth state now, you need to get yours. That is impossible. Right. No one, no one as of right now is in a new earth state. I don't give a damn what you may think. Right. You know? Now, it is true that Yahweh has put an immortal spirit in a mortal body, but the new earth state, that hasn't happened because of the Right. We're still here. See? And listen, the way Dr. Kennedy explained it, and it's based on the scriptures, we all get that together. See, it's the principle of the one penny parable that Joshua gave. You know, he hired some people in the morning said, nine o'clock, say, hey, you work my fields, I'll give you a penny. Another guy comes along at one o'clock, work my fields, I'll give you a penny. Another guy comes in a half hour before closing, 
He said, you work my field, I'll give you a penny. Well, the other guys have worked and sweated all day. He said, well, why is they getting the, the same amount I'm getting? Mm -hmm. And the husband is saying, look, you know, if I feel like being generous, that's my business. It's my money. It's my land. See? In other words, the same, your reward is the same as Adam. And Adam, and look, Adam has been waiting for a long time for his room, for, you know, for that new glorified body of New Earth State. Right. See, he's been waiting the longest. See? But we're not going to get it before him, and he's not going to get it before us. We're all going to get the same penny together. All right? New Earth State. See, this is the fifth age. See, you can look at the ages according to the illustrations. This is, see, this is the end. This is before. This is in the creative age. Here. Mm -hmm. This is at the end of this particular age. All right? This is the beginning of the fifth age or the next age, the new earth state. And then here, see, here we have the sixth age here, which is the veil principle here, because the veil is the sixth step. Now read that. Let's read, uh, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, starting with maybe about 22, maybe. Get my Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. By which also you 15, 22. Oh, 22. One For five. as in Adam all died. Now in Adam, all right. In Adam all died. All die. All right. In Adam all die. Read. Even so, in the Messiah shall all be made alive. Now see, in Adam all die, but in the Messiah all will be made alive. All right. Continue. But every man in his own order. Read. Messiah, the first fruits this afterwards. Is the, this is the Messiah. He's the first fruit. See, because if you remember, when he resurrected, he didn't resurrect by himself. All those who died in the faith, from Adam to John the Baptist, they resurrected along with him. He right. was the first fruits, though. Mm -hmm. They resurrected. Go ahead. But every man in his own order, mm -hmm. Messiah, the first fruits, mm -hmm. afterward, they that are his at his coming. Read. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of Yahweh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule mm -hmm. and all authority mm -hmm. and power. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. See, all empty, this is the all part of it. See, the lake of fire, you see, got the Pope here, and all, all enemies under his feet. Right. See, into the lake of fire. This is the court round about. That would be like under his feet. See, and then we're going to have to get into the renovation of the earth. You know, it's just like this. I used to work in a, a foundry you know, where they deal with cast iron and stuff, you know, and, uh, and I remember one job I used to have to do, you know, we'd get like all the old pieces that, that was rusted, right. you know, broken or something like that. And we would get them and we would put them in a, you know, gather them all together and put it in a hopper. And then they would take that stuff and they would remelt it mm -hmm. and reuse it. And see, and it would, and it would come out, they had this big ladle would come out. And, you know, it's hot and boiling, and you know, they set it down and then they pour, you know, you gotta wear a visor because it's, it's glowing, it'll blind you. Oh, yeah. You know, pour it into a shank pot, and you know, it's sort on of a track and pull it around and, and pushing these molds up, you know, and you gotta pour it into the mold and whatnot like that. But you, and, and when it comes back out, when it cools, because then they'll take the mold, they'll pick it up and shake it, they got a shaker, mm -hmm. and you know, and I got, you know, the hooks, you know, pull out the pieces, and, and, and it'll be just brand new. And it didn't look like what it was when it went in there, all rusty and broken, all like that, because it was burnt out. The impurities, the impurities right. was burnt out of it. So now, and it was renovated or made new again. See, that's what's happening here. The impurities, the flesh, all these concepts, and all these things, it's burnt out and a new earth state. In other words, new wine mm. to be put into new jugs. Right, right now we have new wine, Excuse spirit, me. Baby, old jugs. These old jugs just cannot take it. Right. Because we've got a journey to go to, man. We've got, man, we're just here in this fourth age, at the end of the fourth age. We've got, five, we've got a three-day journey to, to take on. Mm -hmm. Fifth, sixth, and seventh ages, that's a three-day journey, man. This, 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 the skin, this old, what, it can't take that kind of, it just can't take it. It can't take it. Right. That's why the scripture says flesh and blood cannot enter right. to the kingdom of yeah. Yahweh. Mm -hmm. But now here we have the new earth. Keep reading, I'm sorry. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Mm -hmm. 
for he hath put all things under his feet. Mm -hmm. When he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Now he is, he is accepted. Somebody would say he is excluded. In other words, it's the way it was back here. When Yahweh Elohim took on shape and form, he is Elohim. You know, alone and by himself, so to speak. Yahweh pure spirit went out of business and the Son did all the work. So it has to come to a point where everything is put under his feet and then bam, the Son stands alone. And then what? He has accepted, which did put all things under him. Uh -huh. And when, he, when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him. Mm -hmm. That put all things under him, that Yahweh may be all in all. That Yahweh may be all in all. Now, over here, that's the chart here. See, Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The new earth, you see, the, this is the fifth age here, the new earth state. The sixth age is this sixth, is this departmental veil here. And see, the sixth age in the textbook is called perfect. Mm. And some people will might scratch their head and say, wait a minute, I thought seven was perfection. No, that's not what it said. It said perfect. Mm. What do you mean? See, the word perfect in this context means intact. See, everything is concluded under Elohim and put under his feet, and, and he himself is intact or complete, oh. and then he himself is made subject unto Yahweh, right. so that Yahweh might be all in all. Remember, we were over here, and we said this here by Joshua, when he went up on the cloud, that was a fulfillment of the high priest going up on the day of atonement, mm -hmm. see, going up on the cloud. See, here is the same manifestation, because see, this is the sixth age. This is the seventh age, the, the most holy place. Elohim has to go in and figuratively speaking, like the high priest, make a figure eight, you know, or present himself to Yahweh. See, which is like the high priest did when he went up, let's see where we at. When he went up here on the day of atonement, he had to go up and then he had to make a figure eight, flicking the blood up there and then, and then back out and then come back out to here. This is what's happening here. A matter of fact, Oh, where's that scripture at? I think it's Ezekiel. Is it Ezekiel 38 and 1? I think it's. Because, see, see, the charts are complete in themselves. Ezekiel 46 and 1, that's what I want. See, the charts are complete within themselves if you know how to read them. Dr. Kennedy said it best. These charts don't need no improvement upon it. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't make a chart to make some things, maybe certain things, ex, ex, you know, more explainable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I don't see anything wrong with that. However, <laughs> a lot of times, people just don't understand what Dr. Kennedy is giving. You haven't gone through the nth degree enough on these charts. You know, say, well, I'm gonna make a new chart. Uh -huh. so, do you understand the ones right, that are given? Right, right, <laughs> I mean, right. Really, you know, you understand the ones that are given. Right. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 46 and 1. Yes. Thus saith Yahweh, the looked, I mean, the gate of the inner court that looketh towards the east, east mm -hmm. shall be shut. The six working days. All right, now, so this gate going to be shut for six working days. What are you talking about? See, here, Elohim is working for six working ages. Six ages. Because when we read that about Elohim is accepted, that's the sixth age. Him is left, and then he himself has to go into the cloud, which is the seventh age. But now, here, it's working for six, the gate is open, for, I mean, it's closed for six working days. But, but what? But on the Sabbath, it shall be open. But on the Sabbath, or the seventh day, mm -hmm. it shall be open. Come over here. That's right here on this plate. See, Alpha and Omega. See, in other words, on the seventh day, it shall be open. Elohim shall enter in, see, and appear before Yahweh with us. Right. Presenting us, the bride, before Yahweh in the, in the seventh age, which is a sabbatical age. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're there physically? No, we're there spiritually because the physical is gone in the lake of fire. Right. The new earth state, see, which is that glorified body likened unto his, see, really in him. 
See, it's, it's not physical, because flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the lake of fire, see, see, all of this is gone, see. And look, you know, I mean, we, it's not picking up here, but we got the Pope and all. But the sun, moon, and stars, they, they, they're in the lake of fire, too. The whole thing. You know, <laughs> they're the comets, the planets, all of that, they're in the lake of fire. This whole physical creation. Right. And then you're going to have to have a renovation, you see, but, but it's renovated into a more pristine state, not a physical state, but a pristine new earth state, which is incorporeal. See? That's the new earth state in him. Alright? Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. That's Elohim, or Yahshua, and us in him, appearing before the Father on the seventh day, because the gate is now open. You want to finish that? And in the day, of the new moon, it shall be opened. In the day of the new moon, what do you mean new moon? No moon, because no moon, because the moon represents the law of cardinal ordinances. Right. See, so there won't be no, this won't be no law of cardinal ordinances, it will be the law of the spirit. Okay, is there anything else there? No. Okay, good enough. All right, so now, now that's the seventh age here in the most holy place heaven. Here, the sanctum of St. Thomas, this is Elohim stepping out from the most holy place. And see, in the midst of the seven branch lampstand, showing that seven ages right. are now completed. He has seven stars in his hand. That's seven new ages. See? And see, at the end, because here he's at the, the end of seven ages, whereas here he's at the beginning of seven ages. Look up here. Here, we got it right here. Here he is at the end. See this at the end of the seven days. See, see the seventh day is the rest. See that's in the, that's in the most holy place. See, just like the high priest. But now he's got to come out of there, and here he is. See, fully clothed. Seven ages has been completed. Here he's at the beginning. Right. See, before the seven ages. Mm -hmm. See this and this are one and the same. Right. The difference is for us in him, when we see him here, now he is fully revealed, whereas here, because he's nude, mm -hmm. he is hidden in a mystery. Okay? But now at the end of the ages, see, now at the end of the ages, he is now fully revealed. revealed. Okay? Now, that's eschatology. Now we want to back up. We want to get go to uh, Cosmic. Okay, Cosmic and the God here. All right, Theosophy. Intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power, strength. All right. Let me see how I can do this. Now, Dr. Kimberly, you know, let me say something here. The third volume of my textbook, which is the medical section. I didn't used to understand that for a long time. I say that now. I thought I did. Because, you know, I mean, it's a good section. I mean, because it shows the human body as compared to the divine pattern of the universe. Right. Okay. But I didn't really understand that the creation of man mirrors the creation of the universe. It also mirrors the formation of Yahweh Elohim right. into shape and form. Okay? And that's what I really did. And I began to see the connections of that. Well, you know, through these charts here. All right? The theosophy here, because see, this theosophy chart, see, this is the heart. So you can see the outline of the heart here. See, the theosophy plate is. Here. See this heart here? All right. The theosophy plate is an exposition of this heart. It's like if I cut an apple in half, then you would see, you know, what's inside. This is, this is the heart. This represents spirit law. See? 
right? It also represents Elohim. Right. See, Elohim, it, taking on shape and form, is this law of the spirit taking on shape and form. Okay? Now, over here, this is what's in the heart. This is the exposition of it. See, intelligence is first. See, when, that, when Elohim took on shape and form, intelligence came first. Right. The crown, if you will. Flanked by wisdom and knowledge. Together, these three make, a tr make up what we call a triad. Together, it is also called supreme crown. Why? Because just draw a line. That's like, see, that covers your head reach. Your head is the crown of the body, or the, or the head of the body. Intelligence, wisdom, that's, that's like a crown. Mm -hmm. You see that? This is in a triad. All right, now come over here. Now, these three attributes, in turn, produce this attribute, which is beauty, flanked by love and justice. It, it produced this set of attributes. Okay, now this set of attributes also produced another set of attributes, which is foundation, flanked by power and strength, another triad. And these nine attributes are embedded in the tenth attribute, which is called the kingdom. All right, and we have the scripture right here that we should read that, Matthew 25, 34. And see, and that's what this part, and see, and this is the guardian here showing you the anthropomorphic application of these attributes in an anthropomorphic state or form. Go ahead. Matthew 25 and 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, mm -hmm. inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right, this is prepared, this is the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, now, uh, I'll probably piss somebody off, I'm sure I will. I generally do have the time, but let me see, let me see here. This is part here I want to read, I want read. While in the presence of Elohim, 
Moses first heard the voice of Elohim and then saw in the vision Yahweh's super incorporeal form, mm -hmm. which is Elohim, the, t the original archetype pattern. It was from the, this form that Moses saw Elohim create the universe. This taking on of the super incorporeal form from pure spirit and then transforming in part into the creation was Yahweh departing from the pure state of invisibility. invisibility. Listen carefully. Let's look at this chart here. Departing from the pure state of invisibility. See, that's on the bales here. Inscrutable, incomprehensible. In other words, the cloud in this analogy would be like the veil. And he's coming from, from, from behind the veil, taking on shape and form. Read. To a lesser state of visibility. To a le coming from a state of invisibility, which is inscrutable, incomprehensible, to a lesser state of visibility. Or in other words, the incorporeal. Or the intermediate state. Mm -hmm. Thus, it was a Passover from the pure spirit to reveal the incorporeal visibility. Mm -hmm. or, now, now, it was a Passover. In other words, it was a death. Because there was a death down here, and with the death there was blood. See, there are some people saying, well, there's no blood. There's no blood up here with this shape and form. What are you expecting? White corpuscles and platelets? <laughs> of course not. This is incorporeal. But there's still a death, and death is still a, a principle of blood. Because see, it says in there, they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Well, this is the blood of the Lamb. Right. This is Joshua. But see, people say, oh, no, no. They had to wait 4,000 years for this body to bleed blood before the angels could be saved. No. That, I'm going to tell you, that's nonsense. You can't prove it by no Bible. Right. You don't like it, you can see me about it. Because here's the proof right here, and I'm reading it to you. This is a Passover. That's why Dr. Kelly talked about the two exoduses. There's a death here right. with blood on the door. There's a death here with the principle of blood, the blood of the Lamb. They didn't have to wait 4,000 years to be, to be saved. This is, the blood of the lamb. this is the blood of the lamb here, and this is the blood of the lamb here, made flesh. Now the world, yeah, this is what the world has to see, because the world, the world ain't going to see that. It's a tight. So, but, you gotta, but you have to see it here. Yeah, you got to see it here. But they're both one of the same. This is Yahshua too now. Right. Let's not forget that. It's not given to some Trinitarians that, oh, well, they're, 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 they're saved out here, but they're not saved out. There's no blood. Here. What are you talking about? See, stuff like that just lets me know you're just, you just falling into this Christianization of the doctrine instead of taking the time and exploring these charts. Right. See? Now, somebody say, oh, you know, you think you're so damn smart. No, I think the pattern is so damn smart. Follow it. Right. Okay? Keep reading from the where you at. Thus, it was a Passover from pure spirit to reveal the incorporeal visibility. It was a Passover. Listen to what she's. I didn't write that. Dr. Kinley wrote that. This is a Passover. Right. Going from pure spirit into visibility. Coming through the veils. That's why it's up here like this. That's the principle of the Passover up here. Because it's reflecting. And that's what's reflected here. That's why Dr. Kelly said there were two exoduses here. The mystery of the two exodus. Keep going. Or being slain, which made John to understand that Yahshua was a lamb slain before the foundation of the he world. He was the <laughs> slain before the foundation of the world. Before. Mm -hmm. Before anything come forth, your salvation was set up here. You didn't have to wait 4,000 years. Well, yeah, you had to wait 4,000 years to be manifest here, mm -hmm. but you didn't have to wait 4,000 years for it to be set up. Right. It was set up in the beginning before anything comes about. You accept this is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Keep reading. As compared by the Passover feast and the lamb slain before the exodus out of Egypt. <laughs> I can't get any simpler than that. You see the proof here. This is the proof here to show the proof up here. That's why Dr. Kinley talked about the two exoduses. Right. Now that doesn't negate, that does not negate what he did. It does not. Because this is the word made flesh. This is him. This, this is a perfect sacrifice. Coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. Right. 
but there was no sin about him. That's why he could. Dr. Kinley once said, he said, look, you can't get a sinner to atone for another sinner. You have to get a righteous man to do that. Let's see? You have to do that. But, but you can't negate, can't negate this. Right. This is the word. This is the lamb saved from the foundation of the world. Yahshua is the lamb made flesh. It's the same, they're both one and the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't get it. It's just a lot of stuff, but that's okay. That's all right. It's supposed to be that way. See? The thing about it is, what are you going to do? See? And people are sitting up waiting for this and that. And look, that's not to say that it's not going to happen at the end of the age, but Dr. Kennedy said, just be found doing. Right. It's just best be found doing, man. Just do. Keep doing, man. You know? Anyway, I don't want to get off on a tangent. All right. So now here, as we said, this is how this comes about. All right? All right? This is an oval, all right? It's in every female that had an unfertilized egg, that's what it is. And then we got, got, got Sammy Sperm up here, and he's going to, and look, he ain't coming by himself. He ain't coming by himself. He's got like 59 million brothers and sisters, you know, right. you know following him, and they're, and they're all surrounding this egg. They're all surrounding it. I mean, I can't draw 59. I mean, the sperm, but they're all surrounding it. And, and the first one that get there isn't necessarily the first one that'll break in. In fact, they need all the help of these sperms to put pressure on the ovum just so there can be a, a break so someone can slip in. So now someone slips in, all right, and they fertilize the egg, all right, and then the tail breaks off, and then for a short period, it's, you know, I mean, once it's fertilized, then it becomes a zygote. And for a time, it's still one cell right. for a short period after its fertilization. And then, then this little thing kicks in. Mitosis. Mitosis, right? And then cell division, that's what it means. And then one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and then trillions of cells later, voila, <laughs> there you are, all right? But you started off as one cell. Right. Yahweh Elohim, in his formation, super incorporeal form, started off with one attribute, mm -hmm. okay? and multiplying. How this comes about is similar to how we come about. It is also similar to how the universe comes about. Right. Okay? I think I got my book here. Yeah, it's my little science book here. Now, and, and look, the folks that have been trying to understand this thing about the creation for the longest, okay? And, uh, let's see if I can find it. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Ah. Creation of the cosmos, they'll tell you. All right, now, <clears throat> this is what the scientists will tell you. They'll tell you that the Big Bang or this explosion started from one primordial particle, all right? And then it exploded and then it just began to multiply. It went through a period of inflation, atoms forming, becoming molecules, becoming elements, so forth and so on, to galaxies, stars, and so forth and so on, all right? And then, uh, and then they, this is what the scientists say. 
then because the universe is so big, it's expanding, but then at a certain point, it'll get to what they call the great, the big crunch. See, the big crunch. And everything, gravity will force it back into it, you know, force it force back on itself, and it will go all the way back down to a singularity again, declaring the end from the beginning. Now that's how the scientists mm -hmm. explain that. The scientists also say that the universe, supposedly, is like 17 billion years old. See? Now, the reason why we contend with that is because, see, matter is spirit materialized. See, matter is, is the condensation of pure spirit. And see, and you technically cannot time the age of the universe because to do so, you would try to time the age of Yahweh. Right. See, it would be like uh, you take somebody's watch mm -hmm. and look at it and say, oh, well, I can tell how old the watchmaker is. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. See, that's why we contend with that. See, because you can't say how old this universe is because to say that, but we're trying to put an age on Yahweh, and you can't because he's eternal. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, however, we can show, according to the pattern, how this universe comes into being. As we told you over here, this heart, see, that's elevated, which is the same as this guy here. As you see, come over here, you see these hearts up here in the most holy place of all the days of creation. Right. Okay? That's Elohim. Elohim transforming into every aspect of the creation. Here, this is cosmogony. This is at the beginning. Now, we went through eschatology, which was the end. Here's how it began. Here is, this is this heart, which is Elohim. Here is a veil the division between spirit and matter. And I'll say something about this veil here. This veil represents the angelic creation. Right. Okay? See? Now, Elohim is transversing the veil. And look, and he's transmuting in part, not in totality, into one hydrogen atom. And just tells it, be fruitful and multiply. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and then trees and trees and trees and trees of atoms later, we have a universe. Right. You know? But according to the pattern, this is what happened. All of this came into this great amalgamated, conglomerated, coring mass. And out of this mass, and look, this doesn't really do it justice. Because the whole universe is created out of this. Right. Mass. This is a great mass. Yeah. All right? And so now here we have the dividing the first and second heaven. What do you mean? Well, this is the third heaven here, which is spirit law. Right. This is the second heaven. This is the atmospheric heaven. This is the second heaven. And then now this is the first heaven, which is space. Mm -hmm. Okay? The first heaven. And we have the inorganic earth, which is like to the altar, because the earth has molten lava at the core, and it's got the steam and the water surrounding it. So that's, you know, just like the altar of sin sacrifice and the steam and the water surrounding it would be likened to the brazen labor. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of Elohim moved across the face of the deep. That would be like the cup of holy anointing oil. Okay? And this is how the universe is being constructed here. Alright? Out of that. See? And look, and it started from this, it's not depicted this way, but this is, but look, Elohim, look, if, Yah, if Yahweh is a consuming fire, and if Elohim taken on shape and form, see, is, is these attributes that Elohim is a consuming fire too. He's a flame of fire, right. see? You see, matter being spirit materialized comes from out of the fire. So if it comes out from the fire, which is which is Elohim, because he's flame, he's a fire too, he's flames a fire too, then at the end, it has to go back into fire. Mm -hmm. If it starts off that way, then it has to end that way. Okay? Now, these atoms, okay, I think I, I got into it before. You talk about these atoms, you know. The, the idea of an atom is really 
a modern thing. Because for a long time, people didn't, didn't know about the elements. It was speculated upon in ancient times by a Greek philosopher named Democritus. And he was the one that came up with the concept of the word atom. See, the word atom is a Greek word, and it means It means indivisible. It means, or it gets to a point where it cannot be divided anymore. See, Democritus speculated like this. He said this, if you take an object, let's say this, take an object, all right, and then say you divide it in half, then then take that half, divide it into half, take that half, mm -hmm. divide it into half, so forth and so on, half, 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 and, and just keep dividing it until you get a point, get to a point that you cannot divide it anymore, and that's what he called the atom. Okay. Now, believe it or not, he was dismissed and poo-pooed by the great philosophers of his day, meaning people like uh, uh, Aristotle people like that, because they said, no, nah, this is bunk. There's no such thing as atoms. The elements are, there's only four elements, fire, wind, water, and air. Hmm. And, that, and that prevailing thought held out for thousands, literally for over 2,000 years. Hmm. It wasn't until the 19th century where an English chemist, he, his name was John Dalton, and, and he, was a, he was a chemist. And, and, and he speculated that the way gaseous molecules move and react, would, would they would have to be a particle of some sort, some kind of particle. And he was the one who revived the idea of the atom 2,500 years after it was first postulated, okay? So then, from that time forward, scientists were trying to discover or locate or identify these microscopic particles, okay? Now, the first person that did that, he was a, he was a physicist. Uh, his name was, and you can look this stuff up. Anything I put up here, you can look up. His name was J.J. Thompson. And he discovered the electron in the late 19th century. He discovered the electron and named it such. In the early part of the 20th century, one of his students, his name was uh, his name was Ernest Rutherford. And Ernest Rutherford He discovered the proton and the idea that the atom had a nucleus. That was by this guy. This is stuff you can look up. And he made a, it's a very uh, famous test that he conducted to, to find out about the, the proton and the nucleus. It's called a gold leaf test. You can look it up, you know, and, and, and get an idea of what he did. Now, we got the electron found, we got the proton and the nucleus, but there's a missing part, the neutron. That didn't come till much, much later, see? And that was discovered by a man named James Chadwick. He was the one who discovered the neutron. Yes, it does. That's exactly right. In 19, let's put the date up here. In 1932, he wrote a paper outlining it, where he discovered the neutron. Well, guess what, Mr. Chadwick? Dr. Kinley, who received this vision in 1931, saw the neutron in a vision before he discovered it. How about that? Mm -hmm. 
said. See, this was the missing, this was the missing link, so to speak. Because they found the electron, they found the proton, and even the nucleus, but they didn't, but there was something. But they had to find a neutron. See? They had to find a neutron. Okay? Now, and see, and also in the same year, 1931, this guy, I hope you got it, okay. This guy here, Georges Lemaitre. He was a Roman Catholic priest and a scientist. He was the one that came up with the postulation that if you decide to go backwards in time, everything, if everything is, because see, once they, they discovered the universe was expanding, that was discovered by a man named Edward Hubble, of whom the telescope, the Hubble, the Hubble telescope is named after, because see, he discovered that the universe was expanding. This guy said, well, if it's expanding, then, then that means if you go in reverse and contract it, then everything had to come from a single primordial particle. That's what he said. See? Okay? So now, uh, since I mentioned it, and we're, all, we're almost out of time. Yeah, we're getting, we're almost out of time. Uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble was the one who, who discovered it that the universe was expanding by, well, by, by using an experience called uh, the, um, the Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was found by a German guy named Doppler. The Doppler effect is simply this. And you can try this yourself. Stand on the street corner, and if you, and if you hear an ambulance siren or a police siren, just stand, stand where you're at. If the siren is if it's coming towards you, the pitch of the siren will be higher. The closer it gets to you, the higher the pitch of the siren goes. And when it passes by you, then the pitch goes lower. Okay? That's called the Doppler effect. That's with sound. It also works the same with light. Right. If an object, a light object, is coming towards you, that light is going to shift towards the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which means it's going to appear to be blue. And if it's going away from you, then the light is going to shift to the lower part of the spectrum, which is infrared, which means that it'll be red to you. Mm -hmm. So when Hubble went, you know, started doing spectral analysis of stars and galaxies, he noticed what was called a red shift in the spectrum. Basically, it's like this. Let's say if I had a balloon. This is a balloon, and it had dots on it. Okay, now, air is pumped into the balloon. You know, you blow the balloon up. Now, as you blow the balloon up, the more you blow the balloon up, the dots on the balloon will get further and further apart. Get it? Pretend these dots are galaxies. Because this is what Hubble saw. He saw all these galaxies exhibiting a red shift, meaning that they were moving away from each other, meaning that the universe was expanding. See? And that's why there's a red shift, you know, in this. Years ago, uh, people used to say that Elohim was red. Right. And then they used to say Elohim was red. Red man. Yeah, red man. That's what people used to say. Well, let's, let's look at the Doppler effect on this. If you say he's a red man, according to the Doppler effect, if it's blue, he would be coming towards you. Right. But if it's red, that means he's moving away from you. So if you say he's a red man, that means Elohim is moving away, away from, from you. you. <laughs> See? Right. See, I mean, these things, man. People don't understand because they don't take the time to investigate these charts. They don't take the time to engage this vision. And you have to engage it. See, Dr. Kelly said it best. You must make these correlations, else 
you must remain a skeptic. You know, you must take the time to investigate what's on these charts. See, because there's a lot of stuff on here you would be surprised that are on here unless you take the time to look. Okay. All right. Uh, let's. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. I, I want to be under two hours because I have to. Because see, we didn't upload, we didn't broadcast on uh, YouTube today. We had technical difficulties, so I have to upload the video that I'm making in the camcorder on it. And I hate to do that because it takes a million years to do it. But it, but it, it would take longer if, if the video was more than two hours. Then that means that I gotta they'll be separate. Then I gotta weld them together, melt them together, which takes a long time, and then upload it, which takes even a longer time. So I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to, put, you know, make things a little easier. But I help it. But you see, eschatology and cosmogony mm -hmm. declaring the end from the beginning. You know, the end from the beginning. See, and this is how. It all comes about from cosmogony to eschatology, all right? And spirit law controlling all of this, see? This here is a Passover. This is a death. That's blood. That's a sacrifice. That's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And if anybody says otherwise, it's just all of this terms that they really don't understand. They haven't taken the time to look at these charts, see? You have to, you have to do that. I said it all the time. Read, research, and rehearse the matter. <laughs> Dr. Kelly left a lot of information. He said this. I drew seven charts, and I wrote two books. And in another place, I have given you enough to save you. And I, and I believe it. You know why? Because I took the time to look into these things, mm -hmm. to take the time to look at these charts, look at these correlations. And there's, there's a lot of things up here. You'd be surprised if you take the time to look. All I try to get folks to do is do look, do take the time, you know. Yahweh, you'd be surprised the talents Yahweh will give you if you take the time to learn, you know. It blows my mind. I'm doing things now I never thought I would be doing, you know, like writing essays and whatnot and getting a good grade for it. <laughs> that blows my mind. <laughs> You know, I'm still in school. I may go back to school. I'm still in school, so, and I'm thinking about going to school in the winter session. It's like a six-week thing, so, just to keep busy and all. Um, is there anything I need to announce? Uh, uh, we recently got federal tax exempt status. We got that, and we filed for California State exempt. We got that, so we're going on. Also, the thing in uh, the symposium in Dallas, Texas, that's, that's coming on. Last time I checked, a little over 70 people. Hmm. I've registered, so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a nice crowd, and people are still going. So I'll be there. We won't be we won't be here on December the 12th, but we will try to live stream the uh, the event that we can, if possible. We'll try to do that both on Facebook as well as YouTube. Okay. Um, trying to think of anything else. I can't think of you. You can say all of that. You know, I'll let you guys handle that. <clears throat> um, Thank you for watching, as always. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your support, donations and otherwise. We appreciate that. Um, in closing, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be a Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Hallelujah.
and then as a safeguard for us, so we don't get stuck with the material. Okay, and uh, that's about it. Uh, Irene already gave the shout outs, you know, to everybody. Uh, you just for the end of class. And uh, we, we hope that you come back and watch us again next week. And uh, that's about it. Uh, we'll be here hopefully in, uh, like I said, December. It's kind of sketchy because of the events going on. We're going to be gone, Irene and I. So we'll be back uh, about the middle of December. All right, uh, that's all said. Be dismissed. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and present your father to his presence with exceeding joy. To the Holy Mighty God of our Savior, to Yahshua, the Messiah, Messiah, with our glory, majesty, dominion, power, those are all time, now and ever. It's all saying, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A high and lofty one.